Welcome, everybody, um, to today's event, um, to today's exchange and dialogue on state-to-state -state German American state legislator dialogue. It's a pleasure seeing so many of you today. Um, it is our second exchange um, we are uh, we have been doing. Um, the last one we did on digital issues, and I'm seeing many faces here who have joined us, who joined us last time. And I'm so glad that you are back uh, because I think this debate couldn't be more timely. Um, we are going to look um, at climate issues today. And um, this is a week of climate issues. And um, while a lot of times the, the lens or the eye is on the federal level, um, we want to look at the sub-federal level um, because we believe that a lot is decided um, and implemented um, not on the federal level, on the Bundesebene, but actually um, in the states on the sub-federal level. Um, that's where in German we would say die Musik spielt, where the music is. Um, and in the past, um, there have been lots of, um, especially in the area of climate, lots of initiatives um, on, on, state, on the state level, but also on the transatlantic um, sub-federal level. Um, and this is what we want to look at um, today. And um, I'm really happy that we are not doing this alone as an as Aspen Institute, but quite the contrary, we, we have a wonderful partner I would almost say in crime, um, because we do so many things together. Um, and that is the um, American Council on Germany um, with Stephen Soko. Um, we have been doing lots of, lots of initiatives together. So um, I'm really delighted that we are doing this one um, together again. Um, we at Aspen um, have a, another initiative, um, which is closely to, connected to this. This is our Labs of Democracy. Um, which is funded by the German government, where we bring together state legislators from both sides of the Atlantic over three years and three cohorts, um, where we are also looking at a lot of these issues. But these are usually small exchanges of the record exchanges um, and not something we are as we are doing today. So I'm particularly de delighted that we are carrying what we are learning there into a broader sphere. Um, and have the opportunity to discussing this uh, with you um, today. Um, I also want to point out before I hand over to Stephen that two, our, two of our well, mastermind colleagues um, are with us today as well. This is uh, Wiebke Wartenberg and Rob Fenstermacher. If you have any um, also techni experiencing technical problems, have any other questions, those are the two um, you can always connect to during our exchange. And maybe Wiebke and Rob, maybe you can wave so that everybody sees you. Wonderful. I'm delighted um, that we have this exchange today. And um, I would now hand over to, to Steve, who is going to be um, the moderator of the day, the, the man of the day. So <laughs> Steve, the floor is yours. Well, Stormy, thank you for this great introduction and thank you for setting the stage. Um, the ACG is just as excited to cooperate and partner with Aspen Germany as, as you just described. Um, this is a great new initiative that really tries to highlight the role of elected representatives um, at the state level. And it's just a great partnership between our two organizations. So we could not be happier uh, to work with you and, and your team in Berlin. And of course, um, Wiebke and, and Rob get a lot of credit for making this run smoothly. This series not only builds on work that Aspen has been doing, but it also builds on, on programs that the ACG has implemented over the last few years to engage decision makers at the subnational level. And with this series, we hope to broaden the subnational dialogue between Germany and the United States, but also as Stormy alluded to, to include a wider audience in discussions about what happens at this level. Stormy touched on it, but today's event could not be more timely. It comes on the eve of Earth Day, and tomorrow President Joe Biden will convene dozens of world leaders for a virtual climate change summit. This will mark an effort to restart the collective push to address the growing global threat. Earlier this week, it was interesting to hear US Secretary of State Tony Blinken warned that if America does not lead the world in addressing the climate crisis, we might not have much of a world left. But it's not just down to what happens at the federal level. 
um, as is the case with many global issues that our societies face, addressing the challenges posed by climate change and thinking about energy policy has had an increasingly important role at the state and local level. And many state governments in Germany and the US are taking important action against climate change and toward building a clean energy economy, recognizing that action at the local level is critical. Today in our discussion with four state legislators, we will look at the opportunities, but also the challenges that US states and German lender face when it comes to these issues. I hope that we'll hear a little bit about their visions for addressing climate change and also for their view of forward-looking energy policy. As you all know, we're using Zoom meetings for today's event to create a more interactive exchange. So if you'd like to pose your questions, please use the raise your hand function in Zoom and I'll call on you. You can then unmute your audio. You can also send a message in the chat function that you'd like to ask a question, or you can um, pose your question in the chat and I will read it to you. But particularly if you take the mic, given the fact that our time is limited, we'd like to ask you to refrain from making long statements and to keep your questions short and concise and to let us know who your question is addressed to. So without any further ado, let me welcome and briefly introduce our speakers. Their bios are being posted in the chat so you can read up on all of them. From the south of Germany, we are joined by Barbara Becker. She is a member of the state parliament in Bavaria where she is with the CSU. Herzlich willkommen. And from the north of Germany, we are joined by Joschka Knut. He's in the state parliament of Schleswig-Holstein and is with Alliance 90 and the Greens. I would love to talk with both of you separately about what's been going on in both of your parties recently, but that's a subject for another hour long discussion. So we'll table that for another day. On the US side, we're joined by Ryan McKenzie, who's a Republican in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, and by Mari Manugian, a Democrat in the Michigan House of Representatives. Thank you all so much for being with us today. So since none of you know each other, I thought it would be interesting to start with a very quick icebreaker as a lightning round. And I'd like to ask each of you the following question. Why do transatlantic relations and specifically German-American relations matter to you personally? And let's just do this in alphabetical order. So Barbara, let's start with you. Uh, alphabetical order is uh, always me uh, who has to start. Thank you uh, for the invitation. Um, so to your question, it's uh, family and friends first. Uh, we have loads of uh, family members um, uh, in the US. Second, uh, I grew up in, in Bavaria, and I grew up uh, with loads of uh, American soldiers around me who always reminded me that uh, democracy in Germany also was uh, a product uh, of the US. Um, and as a winemaker, um, I had a lot of very interesting and wonderful uh, meetings with other winemakers from Sonoma Valley and in Napa Valley. And I really enjoyed uh, the wine. Thank you. Joschka, what about you? Why do transatlantic relations and specifically the German-American relationship matter to you? Yeah, thank you very much for having me. And um, what a good question to start. I, I would go with friends and family as well, but I would also go with yeah, the business um, connections of my family. Part of my family has a big business in, in Northern Germany and they are strongly connected to the United States. So there is um, also another connection um, which I'm pretty proud of and which keeps this relation pretty interesting for me. Yeah. Thank you. And let's come to this side of the Atlantic. Um, Ryan, how about for you? Yeah, so it's great to start off a call with some transatlantic agreement. I would say that it is friends and family as well. I mean, here in Pennsylvania, we have a rich history of German immigrants coming to our state in the early 1700s. 
Uh, my family on my mom's side is 10th generation immigrants from Germany. And that tradition has continued today. You see a lot of German last names if you go through the phone book. Uh, but to Joschka's point, it, it really is now economic ties uh, that bind our regions. And so in my area, we have a large German uh, medical device manufacturer, E. Braun, who has their American headquarters there. Hundreds of employees are, are in our community because of that. And those economic ties are very strong today and very important to our community. Thank you, Ryan. And last but not least, Mari, how about for you? Thank you. It's so exciting to be here today. Um, so a couple of things. So um, I studied international affairs before I entered the legislature, worked um, with Ambassador Samantha Power at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations. Um, so, you know, making sure that the United States has a strong partnership with Germany um, is obviously a really critically important thing for counterbalancing Russia and other um, more difficult actors uh, across the world. Um, but more personally here in Michigan, obviously, we have um, a really strong automotive industry. And so um, that uh, economic connection between our two countries is really critically important for the economic engine here, uh, Detroit and Michigan. So if I just sum that up, right, it boils down to people and what people do to try to address common challenges. And, um, you know, sometimes it's on the personal side in terms of friends and family, but often it's when it comes down to economic ties. And I do think that we'll get into that a little bit during today's conversation. I certainly hope that we will. But the other important word, of course, is partnership. Um, how can we meet challenges that know no national boundaries, things like climate change? The only way to do it is by collaborating with others and by working with other people. And so you know, maybe that's one of the things that we will find at the end of this conversation is still true. But we're here today to talk about climate change and energy policy at the state level and the role that states play in this. And so I'd like to begin by asking a little bit about the impact of federal policies on climate change and on energy policy at the state level. And Barbara, by the luck of the alphabet, I'd like to start with you again. Um, how do federal policies or the lack thereof influence policies for you in the free state of Bavaria? So first I have to um, apologize for my uh, funny English. If I need any help, Stephen promised me to, to be of assistance. Um, I think we as federal po uh, politicians are closer to the people, a bit closer. And, and uh, I always think we are kind of translators of um, um, state or global policy. Um, we make it concrete. And the other way around, we have, we see in our regions, in our countries, um, um, innovative projects who could help to create uh, uh, politics and policy in a proper way to help uh, climate change um, to cope with. And uh, for example, in Bavaria, we're very successful in, in using um, hydropower hundred, since hundreds of years, 100 years. And we're very successful in, in using solar power. For example, uh, the colleague in the north uh, would say we are very uh, successful in using wind power. And so we, um, we always have to explain the different uh, um, um, uh, resources um, up to the, the, the state level uh, that they can decide what uh, is an intelligent policy for all the country and uh, for, for global ideas to, to cope with the climate change. Thank you. Um, Joschka, let's, let's come to you, particularly since, since Barbara just talked about wind being a factor in the North, um, particularly in, in Schleswig-Holstein. Um, would you like to see more federal policies or is it better for states to be able to, to take their own approach? Well, actually, it, it, it kind of depends. Yeah, I mean, uh, from a legal perspective, I could 
talk about a lot of um, acts we have in Germany that have a positive impact on the way we deal with the climate crisis. And I could also mention some um, laws and acts um, that do not have the positive impact they needed to have to really tackle the climate crisis. So it definitely depends. And what we need to understand when we talk about the German Energiewende, are, I guess two things. First of all, in Germany, um, we have acts and laws on the energy transition on the different federal levels. So there is a federal act on the energy transition and on climate change or climate protection. Um, there's, this is where all the international agreements come into place, where they get real, where, they, where the numbers become um, nationwide um, law. On the other hand, we have a so-called um, energy um, transition and climate protection law on the state level in Schleswig-Holstein as well. And um, we always have to take into account that this law on the state level has to be within the framework the federal level gives us. So this is one important part. Um, another important part about the um, German Energiewende is that we um, understand the Energiewende as a project, a, a multi-sector project. So we don't just talk about energy production, but also about consumptions in the three most important sectors. So energy itself, but also transportation and industry. And there are so many laws having an impact on these sectors that I wouldn't necessarily say we need less laws from the federal level. We need better laws. And then the question is how we bring them into place and how we make them work um, on the state level. So I, I know that's like a, an, an answer a politician would give you, but that's what you get <laughs> in this moment. And I don't want to dive too deep now, but um, we could probably get into the detail of the different laws and um, agendas later on in this discussion, but that's um, for this question. But but Joschka, let me actually push you on this before I come to the American side, um, because I think that, that this is something that we might want to drill into a little bit deeper um, with all four of you. If you say that um, federal laws need to be improved upon, um, how can the states push the federal level to introduce stronger laws or laws that fit better for all of the states? Um, I, I will give you one pretty interesting example. Um, uh, just for the background, you need to know that in Schleswig-Holstein, we have a um, production of renewable energy or out of renewable energies um, of 150% um, of our gross electricity consumption. So we are pretty good. We always call ourselves like the leader in um, renewable energies in Germany. And um, because we have a lot of energy from wind um, power plants, um, we've got a lot of yeah, flexible um, production. And we often can't use all the energy we produce from renewable energies. So we want to bring this energy into some kind of innovative storage projects. Yeah, And um, the big problem we have is that we may not um, use this the energy we produce for this innovative projects because we would have to pay a certain amount of money for the use of this energy. There is a German law, it's called the Renewable Energies Act, um, which, which makes clear that um, the one or, or the, per, the um, company producing energy gets um, um, a certain amount of money for every um, hour of produ produced energy. And um, we wanted as a state of Schleswig-Holstein um, to cut this money and to make um, the, the energy um, usable for the innovative projects, but therefore we had to change the law on the federal level. And we have the power to bring in laws in the state chamber in the Bundesrat um, in Germany, and then the uh, federal government um, has to deal with that if we get a majority in the state chamber. And we got a majority in the state chamber as well as in the um, conferences of the um, energy ministers um, very often over the past, I guess, seven or eight years. 
Um, that's how long this debate goes. And I guess only last year or two years ago, we were at the point where the federal level agreed to change the federal law in a way that we could use the overproduced energy here in Schleswig-Holstein for innovative projects. So there was a lack of five years where we could not start our innovative projects, where businesses were yeah, like stopped to, to create new projects, to create new values here in Schleswig-Holstein. That really was a problem for us. So we had the power to bring in initiatives, but we cannot decide on the laws on our own. The federal level, the federal government has to agree on them as well. And they really were like a break in this situation. So it really cost us some energy and, and some time, but in the end, we were successful in this um, example. I think, you know, from the example that you gave, and, and I think this is probably true in, in the US as well, things sometimes move at a very slow pace. And so there's a, a buildup of frustration about how one can get things moving a little bit more quickly. And I'd, I'd like to come back to the US um, and bring Marion and Ryan into the conversation with the same sort of framing questions. I'd like to hear from both of you about how you view federal policies and their influence on policies at the state level and whether you'd like to see more or less from the federal government in order to facilitate more flexibility at the, at the state level. Mari, why don't we start with you and, and, then, and then bring Ryan in? Yeah, I mean, I can think of two examples of policy that were set forth in the previous administration that um, frankly made things pretty difficult for folks in Michigan. Um, the first was a uh, lack of funding for the Great Lakes restoration uh, initiatives that we have. Um, and so, you know, ever since I was an intern for uh, the, the late great John Dingle, he was a congressman in at the federal level. Um, he was someone who was sort of considered a pragmatic individual in my party, but was a really big conservationist. And so um, he was someone who really worked hard to restore our wetlands here um, and making sure that we had basically like a really strong, um, not just policy protecting the Great Lakes, but had funding to carry out those policies. Um, and so federal, uh, federal laws and federal like rule promulgations can be a bit of a challenge here for us in Michigan um, because we have, we're not only just a border state, but we also have a lot of seaways and water, I'm sorry, we have a lot of waterways. Um, and so that's a big challenge for us. We have the, we have 21% of the world's fresh water um, situated uh, in our state. So that's something that can be challenging, but something that is more on the positive end of things. Um, is that I think setting a strong agenda at the federal level kind of gives uh, state legislatures um, the opportunity to uh, really access and capture federal drawdown dollars, depending on how we structure our laws um, regarding emissions or um, regarding, uh, for example, in Michigan, I'm sure most of you have heard about the Flint water crisis, figuring out how we're going to implement uh, you know, updates to our infrastructure, particularly with our groundwater. Um, and so having a, a clear federal agenda about how we're going to move forward with clean and green energy opportunities um, really helps us be able to shape policy in ways that help us access the, the greatest amount of federal dollars. Um, you know, we pay our taxes to the feds as well as to the state here. Um, and so being able to capture that uh, money is really critically important. Thank you. And, and Ryan, what's, what's your take from, from Pennsylvania? Sure. So, I mean, I see energy as a very traditional federal state issue. There is a role for both of those parties to play in, in this kind of legislation. And there are just some things simply uh, from strategic or national guidance or investment that states can't take under uh, on their own. So, you know, for instance, the last administration worked in a bipartisan fashion to pass the Energy Act of 2020, which is really focused on technology investment in things like national grid storage, uh, advanced nuclear, things that, again, a, a state can undertake on their own. At the same time, uh, we here in Pennsylvania have been doing uh, some pretty innovative things. Just yesterday, we passed legislation uh, that allows for individual power companies to allow their uh, subscribers to invest in local solar. And so if they all sign up and show an interest in that, uh, then that utility company can actually have a, a base of subscribers already committed and know that the revenue source is going to be there. They can go out and contract with a solar provider to actually develop that solar field in their region and, and undertake a, a local solar option that way so that people have, as utility customers, 
have a 100% solar option that they're paying for. Uh, so that just passed out of committee yesterday. But again, that's an example of a, a state uh, approach that is, is small and local, uh, but something that people and the market is actually driving, people are interested in and they want to undertake. So again, I think there is a role and involvement for both of those. And I think that's the important and right approach in, in the U.S. just because states, uh, it, it, for everybody that's been here to the U.S., and, and I know it's similar in Germany, uh, are so different in so many different ways. And uh, the interest in uh, certain energy sectors or, or types of energy uh, really depends on your region. And I, I think it's important to respect that and continue that tradition as well. Of course, you know, particularly with the, the summit that President Biden is um, calling tomorrow and, and Friday, um, and with the Biden administration coming into office and, and the United States return to the Paris Climate Agreement, much is being made of America being in, America being out, America being in again. But one of the points that seems to come up over and over again is that even when President Trump decided to take America out of the Paris Climate Agreement, there were many states, many cities, many businesses that continued to try to uphold some of the guidelines and, and tried to be involved in, and engaged. And that underscores the role of states and regions and even cities in trying to address climate change, but also in trying to shape energy policy for their, for their regions. And so I guess one question that I have for all of you that, that might be interesting for our viewers is to hear about any examples that might exist of collaboration between states. So not really involving the federal level at all to try to address climate change, to try to shape climate change policy or, or energy policy. Um, do any of the four of you, I see some nodding, but do any of the four of you have any, any thoughts of that on that? And, and who wants to go first? Mary, you unmuted quickly, so <laughs> yeah, I'll let you go I can, first. <laughs> I'll start, I guess. That's fine. I mean, I think um, something that we're, I don't know that we're necessarily at the point where we're able to uh, reach across state lines here um, in the Midwest to talk about this more broadly, but a couple of things that I think are um, really pertinent to this conversation is um, just that we are doing really strong public-private partnerships and having strong conversations about um, a, a new electric vehicle charging grid and infrastructure. All of those modernizations need to happen. Um, and of course, we've seen announcements from um, many American car companies that they will not be producing um, any uh, petroleum-powered cars um, you know, in, in 2050 um, and further down the line. So uh, folks at GM have done a, a really interesting campaign to sort of roll out what the future of um, automobiles might look like. And so with that, of course, we need to have really robust conversations about uh, creating a um, electric vehicle charging system in our state. Um, and then of course, partnering with other states in the Midwest. So this can be a more uh, robust system that connects everyone to each other. The other thing that we sort of struggle with, I will say um, that's a more positive conversation, but something we really do struggle with in Michigan is still a conversation around um, Enbridge's line five. Um, so obviously we are trying to transition to a more um, sustainable economy, but of course the conversation around um, not just uh, getting uh, reasonably priced fuel to the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, um, but also having a really um, kind of difficult conversation about uh, what the future of labor looks like uh, with regard to that line. Who is doing the maintenance of that tunnel? Um, is, is the tunnel a solution uh, for folks who are unfamiliar with line five? Um, it is a, uh, it's the way that um, this particular energy company is able to deliver energy to folks in the UP. Typically it's propane, sometimes it's oil. Um, and that's a really important partnership that we maintain with Canada. Um, and so that's something that is a challenge that we face, uh, sort of figuring out how we're going to modernize um, the safety and security of that pipeline, uh, making sure that there isn't an oil spill in the Great Lakes, but also making sure we have reasonable energy prices for our constituents that live in the Upper Peninsula. Um, so I would say that, you know, those are conversations that we have that are ongoing, um, both at the legislative level and of course at the executive level, with um, Governor Whitmer and her counterparts um, to figure out what the proper solution might be to that challenge. 
Ryan, you were raising, you were um, nodding your head as well. Do you want to jump in here? Yeah, absolutely. So here in the northeastern part of the U.S., there is an initiative called REGI. It's uh, R-G-G-I, or the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And so that is a, a collaboration across state lines where uh, states have committed to reducing their carbon emissions over certain periods of time. And so that's a, an initiative, again, that's coming up from the state level. Uh, but it's controversial here in Pennsylvania because we are the third largest exporter of electricity in the entire country. And we're second in natural gas and top three in coal and nuclear as well. And so as those other states in the region have started to reduce their emissions by oftentimes restricting power production and power plants, uh, that burden has come to Pennsylvania. Uh, but on the flip side, that also gives us tremendous economic opportunity. It's created thousands of jobs here in Pennsylvania. The development of natural gas has been a huge boom, not only in jobs, but in tax revenue for Pennsylvania. And so that's, that's a great thing as well. Uh, but now we, as uh, one of the last Northeastern states not in REGI, are in this issue and, and kind of a bind because we have taken on and shouldered the burden for energy production for other states in the region. Uh, but the, the main driver of our reduction in greenhouse gases has been the transition from coal to natural gas. And you know, some people love natural gas and some people don't, uh, but for us, it has been a very important part of our economy that is not going to uh, go away and it shouldn't. Uh, we wanna continue to invest in that space uh, for all the economic reasons I talked about. Uh, but so it is a challenge at the state level to, to try to balance those things. And uh, it's something that we're dealing with and wrestling uh, between, uh, as Mari mentioned, kind of a, an executive legislative balance uh, is going on on that front right now, and that, that dance is going to continue. Thank you both. I'd, I'd like to bring Barbara and Yoshka back into the conversation um, and hear sort of from a German perspective if there are examples of sort of state-to-state -state collaboration in dealing with some of these issues. Yoshka, you're nodding your head. Um, let me go to you first, and, and then we can bring Barbara in. Yeah, actually, I've got two pretty interesting examples, and one just came to my mind because I just like got the final report two weeks ago um, when I was working in the Ministry for the Energy Transition in Schleswig-Holstein a few years ago. We started a pretty interesting project, um, a joint project of the states of Hamburg and Schleswig-Holstein. Hamburg, you know, big city of Hamburg and um, Schleswig-Holstein, the pretty rural state where we produce all the renewable energies, and we had a pretty interesting um, a joint project um, which um, aimed to be showcasing the energy landscape of tomorrow. So where we wanted to identify the success factors for um, the implementation of an integrated energy transition. And this really was a pretty big project. We had over 60 joint partners from science, big industries, um, steel industry, for example. Um, we had all those producing renewable energies in this joint project. And now we've got the final report finally um, a few weeks ago. And um, that really was a successful project for us to now frame the way we have to go to implement the energy transition in the upcoming years. And another pretty interesting um, project, um, which is like a bit next level, um, is the um, is a joint project of the northern German or the states of northern Germany, um, um, where we yeah, developed our own um, hydrogen hydrogen strategy, um, because we are pretty aware that hydrogen is like the big next big thing in, um, in Germany and a pretty important success, success factor for the realization of the energy transition and um, the states as well as the federal level are heavily investing in production infrastructures in strategies for hydrogen in the next years or actually they are starting now and this is a pretty interesting joint project of the northern um, German states um, to identify joint projects and um, to be more effective in the way we invest into um, hydrogen over here. Thank you and Barbara. Yeah. Um, I could add same for, for uh, southern parts of Germany. So it, we have a very good cooperation between Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg. So the both southern uh, Bundesländer. It's also a um, um, hydrogen strategy. Um, 
on the other hand, I'm uh, another example. Uh, I'm a member of parliament from the driest and hottest region all over Germany. And so we can see really early that our forest is suffering. So we have, um, I think, it's also the southern uh, Bundesländer. We have a forest strategy, um, how to, uh, um, to preserve our forest, uh, how to save it. And on the other hand, Bavaria is very proud and uh, very independent. Um, so I'd like to add another example. Um, it's like a te technical innovation transfer. So um, researchers and scientists in, in uh, my region invented um, uh, what they like a TCR technische, uh, not, not a thermische Katalyse. It's in German. Uh, it's oh, a, a cat, um... Catalysis. Catalysis. Yeah. Um, it's a uh, catalyst. Ah, okay. So uh, what it means is that they uh, they take uh, different types of residue and waste and change it into uh, um, bioenergy and renewable uh, fuels, for example. And um, it's a big success that we export uh, the technology and we get some hydrogen and and um, the, the renewable fuels back. And we do this, for example, with other technologies like um, my dry and hot region um, is really uh, close working together with Israel because they have more experience with that. I could add more examples. Yeah. Well, I, I think this is great because it also um, provides an opportunity to, to take the conversation in a slightly different direction. I think, Barbara, you know, the, the points that you were just making about technology um, tie in very closely with comments that were made earlier that had to do with labor and employment, but also the economics of all of this and the business opportunities that exist. And to come back to one of the key concepts that we talked about at the outset, how do we make all this sustainable, right? What's the sustainability component to it? And so I'd be curious to hear from, from each of you how your states are trying to turn energy policy into an economic development opportunity. Um, Ryan, you started talking a little bit about the role of natural gas. Of course, everybody on this call has heard about Pennsylvania in terms of, of fracking. Um, Mari, you were talking about e-vehicles and how important the automotive industry is for um, Michigan. It's obviously also very important for German states like Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg. Um, but there are huge challenges ahead. Um, I, I guess I'd be really curious to hear from each of you how your states are trying to think of this in economic terms, um, whether it's in construction and um, reducing the use of energy in new buildings, whether it ties into urban development, whether it ties into economic development opportunities and job creation opportunities that your states are exploring? Because uh, I think that's a very important piece of this, of this puzzle. So Steve, I'll, I'll jump in there. And uh, for us in Pennsylvania, I mean, we are trying to find those opportunities that are win-win for the environment and for the economy. And that's really the sweet spot where we find bipartisan agreement, people come together, and so let me give you one example on that was legislation that I passed last session for what I call advanced recycling. And so there's new technology that's come to the market uh, that allows for instead of traditional recycling where you're melting or burning plastics, this through high pressure and no emissions can break down plastics, all plastics, even the very hard to recycle plastics or they have contaminants, et cetera, through high pressure can break it back down to the molecular level and then because of that, you can create virgin uh, grade plastics out of that that can be re reused for everything from medical uh, purposes to food purposes, et cetera. So you can get that out of your waste stream and out of the environment and back to, to plastic uses, or because you're taking it back down to the molecular level, you can also use it for things like jet fuel. And we have a company here in Pennsylvania that's doing that. But that wasn't possible just a couple of years ago because our regulations and permits hadn't kept pace with that new technology. 
So I passed legislation that within our existing framework of permits, we said we want to identify and define this new technology to go through our Department of Environmental Permitting process to make sure they aren't uh, putting emissions into the environment. And by doing that, we've created new economic development. So we already have two companies in our state that are doing that. Uh, two or three others are looking at half a billion dollar investments in Pennsylvania to do this type of work. Again, taking the plastics out of the environment and the waste stream and turning them into either new plastics and in kind of a circular fashion, or even uh, you know replacing fossil fuels that would have had to have been taken out of the ground for jet fuel in that example. So again, that is an example of a win-win for the environment and for the economy. And it's just one example of the many that we're doing here in Pennsylvania, but we're always on the lookout for those things that kind of pair those two, two options together. Go ahead, Mari. Sure. So, um, you know, I think what's really um, kind of cool about Michigan, obviously, is that we have a really strong um, labor history. And uh, one of the things that we've really set out to do um, over the past couple of legislative sessions is um, do a lot of com have a lot of conversations and a lot of investment in um, helping folks get associates degrees and uh, having them enter the skilled trades and uh, entering the skilled trades you know maybe 10 even uh, 20 years ago uh, would have maybe not included green uh, jobs or maybe wouldn't have included um, you know really robust um, uh, investment in green energy jobs but that's sort of changed a lot. Um, my father was a utility worker, and so this is something that we've talked about for a long time in my house. And um, you know, the transition for many of our energy companies, a lot of the, a lot of our big energy companies, we have a pretty regulated market here in the state of Michigan. Um, both DTE and Consumers Energy are our two biggest energy providers to the state of Michigan. Um, they have done, a, they've without the prodding of our state government have rolled out initiatives to be carbon neutral by uh, 2040. And so that's a really, uh, that's something that's being driven by industry. And so as that is happening, things that we're doing at the state level would be um, to make sure that we have workers that are trained to help carry out those big plans. Um, and so that's something that we see as um, something that can jumpstart the economy post COVID. Um, even just yesterday in the energy committee, we had folks from both the IBEW um, as well as the Utility Workers Union of America come in to talk about the kind of training they do for these new jobs in this industry. Um, and so that's sort of what we see uh, regardless of partisanship, we sort of see that as the future for energy in the state of Michigan. Uh, knowing that we need folks to be trained um, and highly skilled to do these jobs. I think training is obviously a really crucial element in all of this. And, and I see certainly the two Americans nodding their head. But you know, when I think about training and workforce preparedness, I think about the German model and how good the German model is in giving people vocational and technical training. So Yoshka and, and Barbara, um, any thoughts from, from you about how sort of incorporating or folding in um, climate policy, energy policy can also serve as a catalyst for economic development? Um, Barbara, go ahead. I'll allowed to start first. Uh, sure. Uh, for example, in 2016, uh, we had statistics that renewable energies uh, create, I think it was uh, 340,000 jobs all over Germany. Looking into the um, close future, it's just for my Bundesland, for, for Bavaria, it's uh, that all the sustainable um, economics, uh, uh, they could create 200,000 jobs extra, just this branch. So, so um, it's obvious that we, we in Germany we always uh, are very proud of being the state of uh, the nation of engineers and um, research and innovation is creating jobs. For example, in Bavaria, we, we, um, last year we decided in, in my little parliament to uh, invest 2 billion euros in the next three years um, to create new solutions for um, uh, climate and environment. And uh, all the money goes to research and uh, to the universities, to schools, and to our very special little and middle-sized companies. And we expect, 
uh, that they invent new things and new solutions for uh, to solve these problems and uh, not to be uh, well. Oh, my English is really horrible. Uh, to to give all the people um, um, optimistic ideas and, and not to be afraid of the future, but to to um, to be proud of what what we can what we can do concerning environment and climate. <laughs> No, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, that was that was understandable. Everybody's nodding their head. That was that was a good statement. So thank you, um, Yoshko. What what about what about you? Yeah, actually, the situation in Schleswig-Holstein is um, well. It is, I guess, a bit complicated looking um, uh, to the future because, um, as I said in my first statement, we are pretty good in producing renewable energies, and that is a big opportunity for us. But that also is a risk. Because if we do not manage to yeah, add more value and to create more value out of this good renewable energy production, we are at the position of risk that the, all the good jobs will be in other states in Germany. And um, so what we are really strongly working on is creating more value out of the energy, energy transition. So we have to bring new industries to Schleswig-Holstein. And at the same time, we may not forget, as Ryan and Mary also mentioned, we may not forget to like bring our old traditional industries to the future, to support them on their way to the future. And we already have 20,000 jobs in Schleswig-Holstein in the renewable energy sector. That is pretty good for a small state as Schleswig-Holstein is. But um, we also have a lot of very good jobs in our traditional industries. And we really have to try to help them to create or to, to be part of the transformation. And I will give you two examples. We've got a big serial production unit in Schleswig-Holstein. It's one of the biggest in Europe. And they became one of the biggest over the past decade. And they became one of the biggest um, um, units because and, and companies because they understood that they need to be more energy efficient than their competitors. And they are more than 40% effect, more effective than their competitors. And that made them become one of the most important serial producers in Europe. So this is a success story, but they need the support, those businesses, those companies need the support to create the transformation. Another pretty interesting example is um, a old oil refinery. Um, it's located in the southern part of Schleswig-Holstein. And I mean, they are not climate friendly. They are a oil refinery, but they understood that they will not have a future if they stay an oil refinery. So they have to become a climate friendly refinery. So they are really changing their whole business model at the moment to use the energy, the renewable energies we have in Schleswig-Holstein and use the technology they have in the units to produce climate neutral hydrogen um, and um, what is it called? Uh, kerosene for the um, airplanes um, for the um, yeah, airport Jeff, of Hamburg. Yeah. So um, that is what they are working on. And they want to become Germany's first climate neutral oil refinery. And those are pretty interesting projects, which could, coming from an old traditional industry, create new industries and locate them in Schleswig-Holstein. And that is what we need to um, achieve um, to create yeah, good jobs for the future in Schleswig-Holstein. And um, that is what we are working on. Thank you. I think that was a, a great example. I know that, that Barbara wanted to add something to that. So let me um, ask her to, to unmute her mic. Yeah, thank you. And I saw Martina hund Mejon, uh, I think, uh, who's probably next. Um, uh, Joschka, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, we have really high energy prices in Germany. Don't you think that they help to, to make the transformation quicker in the, the classical industry? Because in, in, in my region, I see um, that the, the old old style industry companies, they... they um, um, uh, was I see, I'm erreicht. I don't know. Um, achieved. 
they achieved, thank you, they achieved to, to use only 10% of the energy they, they had to use 10 years ago. And this is a big success. And uh, still we need their products. Uh, Thank you for that addition. So I have um, questions from a couple of people, but Martina, why don't you go first? Thank you, um, Stephen, and thanks for hosting this session. It's great. Full disclosure, I'm a board member of Royal Dutch Shell uh, that obviously operates uh, in, in the United States as well as in Germany. Um, and I'm a relatively new board member. I've been uh, on the board for about a year uh, and have been working with the company through a very difficult time, uh, given where energy prices were last year due to COVID, uh, as well as the energy transition. And I think uh, probably all of you know that Shell is on the forefront um, of the energy transition with all of the investments that we're doing in hydrogen and in uh, renewable energies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, gas is an important transition fuel. Um, so I like what Ryan said. Um, you know, from my perspective, a, a company like Shell uh, being able to work on the state and on the federal level is super important. And it's super important to get consistent legislation because, you know, we're working in 200 plus countries the world then you add all the states to it. And that is sometimes a real challenge, right? Not only do you have to deal with the climate change deniers, but you also have to, to, to deal with the, the infrastructure and uh, the circumstances that are different in every state as well in every country. So there is just an appeal from me to you guys. This is not easy. And if you all wanna move forward fast, rather than using you know, five years at a time, there needs to be some help for the big companies to be able to do that. The second big challenge where I would see um, and would hope to get some input from you guys is uh, technology and people. You know, in order for a company like Shell to be um, helping on the energy transition and in order to transition to the cleaner fuels, a lot of things have to happen in technology. So Barbara, it was, it's music to my ears and I know Germany does this in a very consistent way uh, in terms of supporting universities, research institutes, et cetera, with money and with resources like really well-trained people so that we can move the technology forward and that we can hire people who have, you know, that unbelievable knowledge on how to innovate and to get us forward. So I, I would love to hear from everyone in terms of what do you think we could do better? What can, how can we cooperate more so that things go faster? Thank you. Thank you, Martina, um, both for the, the comment, but also for the question. From our, our panelists, um, who would like to respond first? Uh, Steve, I, I'll be happy to jump in. So um, for Martina, I mean, thank you for your question. And very directly and just purely in practical terms, here in the US, there are a couple state associations of legislators across the country. And I'm on the national board of both NCSL, which is the National Conference of State Legislators, and also the national board for CSG, which is the Council of State Governments. And so there are two organizations that actually uh, help promote uh, policy and legislation across state lines. So just to your example or, or question about you know, having uh, similar legislation across the country, those are two organizations that uh, you or your organization might want to get involved with. Uh, they often promulgate uh, best practice legislation or, or model legislation uh, that states end up taking up. Uh, so th those might be good avenues for you in the US. Uh, the other thing, uh, just on innovation in, in how we can help solve this, you know, I saw a Pew study that said here in the US, 55% of people felt that innovation was one of the main drivers of how we're going to solve climate change. And I think that's correct. I mean, I, I agree with that. And I think we need to invest in innovation 
and invest in the people, as I think Mari and some others have pointed out, uh, that can actually uh, undertake that those innovative new technologies. But you know, I, I think we're, that's one of the leading ways we've seen, and, and I mentioned it with natural gas, uh, has been a great transition for us to a cleaner economy that's also led to jobs. And I, I think we're going to see that in other spaces as well. So we need to continue to innovate and invest in those spaces. Do any other panelists want to weigh in briefly? So we have a, a couple of other of other questions, but before I turn to those questions, let me um, look at the four panelists and see if we can go over by five or 10 minutes, if your schedules will allow that um, so that we can accommodate a couple of, of questions or if you have a hard stop um, in five minutes. I've got a hard stop, we're caucusing at one. Okay. Um, then does, of the people who have questions, does anybody have a question for Mari? Um, Stormy, Hubatos, do either of you have a, store, a question for Mari or um, I'm not seeing a sign. So let me go to Christian Fosna because he was next in line with a question. So Christian, if you can um, turn your camera on and unmute your mic. It's both there. on, Steve, okay. thanks. There you are. Thanks. Go ahead. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for having this debate. Yeah? So it's very really, uh, useful, insightful, and uh, instructive. Yeah, I'll be brief. Yeah, and a brief questions. Yeah, first to uh, to both of you, Ryan and Mally. When you, um, we all subscribe to the goal. Yeah, reduce uh, um, emissions, yeah? CO two emissions. Yeah. So when you have to balance it, yeah? what's more important and what brings us faster and closer to this goal? Yeah, private investment or state investment, regulation or innovation. So if you have to balance this, yeah, and maybe to our German, yeah, Joschka and Barbara, to our German speakers, yeah. So we assume after the next federal elections, yeah, there might be a conservative green coalition. So will climate policy a dividing issue or a uniting issue of the or during the coalition talks in Germany? Thank you. Great questions, Christian. Oh. Let me go to Mari first, because I know the clock is ticking. Yeah, before I run the caucus, I can address that. So I think that you're right. I think that there's a really um, delicate balance we need to strike to um, get, you know, obviously get our uh, focus at our universities, for example. Um, I, although I went to Michigan State University, I know the University of Michigan does really good research and development in this field. And so making sure that we're able to support the good work that our uh, research institutions are doing while at the same time allowing for innovation, um, that's a balance that we have to strike um, as lawmakers and of course through the executive um, here in Michigan as well. So that's a, that is definitely a challenge, but I think that you know one of our greatest assets, uh, at least in my state, is the fact that we have um, many, many state uh, colleges and universities that do excellent research and have been really good partners. Um, even for uh, some, some work that we're doing on uh, solar pilts, so uh, local uh, solar uh, here in our state, it's this work group that we're actually on is being run through the University of Michigan. Um, it's something that the governor has put together where we have members of the state legislature from both sides of the aisle, um, folks across in the industry um, gather together to have some conversations about what this legislation could look like in the future. Um, and so seeing that private partnership, uh, private public partnership, as well as um, the support that we're receiving from a research institution has been incredibly helpful. Mari, thank you for that. And thank you so much for joining us today. This has I'm been- sorry to run fantastic. you guys. <laughs> it is all quite all right. right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Ryan, over, over to you. Yeah, so to directly answer the, the question there, um, it, for me, it's private industry that's going to need to make that type of investment. And I'll tell you why. I mean, I think that the it's when you look at federal uh, government, state government, and then private investment here in the US, federal government, they can obviously print money. They can uh, make those kind of large investments if they, if they choose to do that. And they've done that in the past here in the US. Um, less uh, maybe ability to do that after we've done so much stimulus and uh, economic investment in, in other areas in the past year. Uh, state government, our role in this process 
is I always tell people it's three things. We can uh, change our tax policy so we can reduce the cost to invest here, maybe through R&D tax credits, et cetera. We can improve our regulatory environment, and we can also work on workforce development. We're, I have till 1.30, Steve. The, uh, okay, thanks. We won't, we won't go that yeah. long, I promise. <laughs> I promise. Uh, um, sorry about so, that interruption. So, so let me just, uh, if I can finish, Steve. So in, in state government, it's tax policy, it's regulation, it's workforce development. Uh, but so we can do those things to create an environment where businesses can invest and be successful here in, in Pennsylvania. And so that's our job. But again, the actual investment in dollars are going to have to come from industry. And we've seen that. We've seen, uh, again, with natural gas, uh, if you create that policy, when we uh, updated our state legislation here in 2008 to allow for fracking, that flooded the zone here in Pennsylvania. And it's been a real positive development because not only is the actual drilling and fracking going on, but now we're starting to see, you know, 10, 12 years later, the downstream impacts of that. So now there is a, a, a cracker plant or, or for petrochemical cracking uh, to make plastic products creating thousands of, of construction jobs, thousands of full-time employment jobs in, in plastics industries. And then like I talked about, recycling comes after that. So you can see how the, the government made the environment for the investment to come, but the private sector was the one that's going to need to provide that money because at the state level, we, we can't print money and we, we don't have the ability to make those large scale investments that are needed. Thanks, Ryan. So over to you, Yoshka and Barbara, um, are green topics going to bring the conservative Christian Democrats and the Green Party together, or will they divide them in potential coalition negotiations? Will I start this time? So I'm actually, I am in a coalition with the conservatives and the liberals. Um, coming from that, I would say um, it will definitely be uniting in the coalition talks and in creating a narrative for this coalition. And it will be at least challenging, maybe dividing in the daily business. And coming to your questions, Christian, um, I will make it short. Um, I would say regulate emissions, deregulate the um, use of renewable energies. Um, reduce barriers for private investments in working technologies for renewable energies and use uh, public money, state money for the infrastructure we need for renewable energies and the climate change. Um, I make it short and simple. I mostly agree. Uh, I think a, a possible coalition of uh, the Conservatives and, and the uh, Allies and Green um, could bring out uh, the best of both sides. And we have another example in, in Austria, a very tiny little country. They had a very intelligent contract of this coalition. And it could be like this, best of both sides. Thank you. So let me now ask Stormy and then Hubertus to ask their questions. And I'll come to each of the three of you to make final comments to close out this session. And you can respond to their questions um, as, you, as you like. So Stormy, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a very enlightening debate. And I'm very happy that we also brought in the business uh, voice um, in exchange between uh, government and business. And I see one of my former colleagues, uh, Carsten Rolle, also um, in the audience from the Federation of German Industries. And I can only recommend um, if you want to know anything about the business side <laughs> of um, climate issues and transition, Carsten is the, the person to talk to. And there is this picture as, as well. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, the first one is um, on carbon pricing and the second one is on um, fossil fuel subsidies. And um, what I'm wondering with regard to carbon pricing, um, to to really advance an energy transition um, and uh, to advance um, on, on cl climate protection, I, I think we need a price on carbon. And there are different approaches to this, um, both on both sides of the Atlantic, but also within the United States, there are different ways how to price CO2. So my question is, how do we get this together? Um, and what would be the best way to do so? And my second question is, um, 
in my former role, but also currently, I've been highly involved in the G20 and the G7. Um, and there's always talk about if we want to have a green transition, we also need to get rid of um, fossil fuel subsidies. Um, and uh, my question, and, and it never really, well, countries didn't, didn't succeed in agreeing on this. And um, my question was, uh, would be is, what is your opinion on this? Um, would you see fossil fuel subsidies as an impediment to a green transition? Or do you say it would be part of it? And very last point is um, we hear so much on building back better or building forward better, um, both in the EU as well as in the United States now. And I wanted to know, are you happy um, with federal programs um, which are right now pumping money into the economy, which is also very much needed to, to um, to uh, stimulate economic growth and to get us through the pandemic. But are you happy with regard to if that money really leads to a transition and is really used to build back better or build forward back better? Or do we need to make, or do we need to be um, more targeted in what we are doing with the money? Thank you, Stormy. So let me let Hubertus add his questions to the mix um, and then we'll, we'll do a final round. Just one question. Well, we talked a lot about legislation today, and it was good to hear some uh, promising uh, tendencies that we get things done. But when I um, think about the story that Joska shared with us, seven years, I think you mentioned, uh, and I think there are many more examples, I'm deeply, deeply, deeply concerned. I'm a lawyer by training, so I'm not against the rule of law. In fact, I'm in favor of it. But I wonder whether uh, such a global thing such as climate change is correctly adapt, uh, addressed by the current structure of our legislation? Do we not move, need to move away drastically from local regional legislation to a more cross-border, possibly global legislation? I was an active participant in the Paris Agreement, the COP21. Um, we have seen a discussion thereafter. I believe we need a disruptive new approach to global norms that we can execute on. What is your thought on that? Thank you. So um, let's do a, a final round um, with each of you. I was going to suggest going in reverse order from our uh, starting order, but I'm also looking at you three to see if anybody wants to volunteer and take on any of the questions that Stormy or Hubertus have posed first. Not seeing that, Ryan, it's over to you. All right. Well, uh, I guess th thanks for throwing the hot potato to me, Stormy. You gave some uh, difficult questions there right at the end. But, you know, I, so let me handle them in order. You mentioned carbon pricing and then uh, fossil fuel subsidies. So on carbon pricing, uh, I have seen that is uh, a, the, an issue that has declining interest here in the U.S. And I'll, I'll say that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you know, I think on the Republican side, uh, just in general, they aren't in favor of increasing taxes or costs uh, on consumers. Uh, but at the same time, I think there is growing recognition on the Democratic side here as well that we have to be very conscious of what these policies mean uh, in terms of inequality and lower income individuals. And so something like carbon pricing could potentially be driving up costs for individuals. And we know that for low income individuals, uh, energy, transportation, et cetera, are larger parts of, of their uh, personal budget than maybe for higher income individuals. So that has been something that's declining in interest. I think you have to look at the flip side and where I personally come down is we wanna figure out how to drive down the cost of new energy and renewable energies to make those more com uh, competitive with fossil fuels and make them more uh, cheaper and affordable energy sources uh, for all individuals. Uh, the second question uh, was on subsidies. Uh, now, that's an interesting uh, topic, fossil fuel subsidies, that I think is actually uh, potentially going the other direction. And so there is gaining bipartisan support against uh, fossil fuel subsidies and, and corporate welfare in general here in the U.S. I think uh, largely, you know, obviously in this particular space, Democrats were, would have been opposed to fossil fuel subsidies in the past. Uh, but now there is a growing populist backlash here in the U.S. of Americans being opposed to corporations and uh, even fossil fuel corporations, any kind of big corporations that maybe 
uh, had been taking advantage of taxes and paying, paying or paying no taxes uh, here in the US while reaping huge benefits uh, are seeing now a growing Republican backlash. So uh, subsidies of any type uh, for corporations, I think there is bipartisan agreement to try and go and end a lot of those. And uh, if, if you want to, uh, Steve, I'll, I'll take uh, for, for uh, Hubertus, uh, just to answer your question briefly. I mean, it's something, you know, we at the state level, uh, we're trying to play our part, um, you know, and so we're trying to do what we can, but sure, if you want to impact uh, the climate around the world, uh, you need to be engaging uh, people like China and India who, who are huge energy uh, producers and users and uh, greenhouse gas emitters. Um, you know, we can play a, a limited role at the state level, and I think it's important that we do our part, uh, but you need to engage uh, all those national stakeholders uh, to make larger change. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Yoshka, it's, it's now over to you. Yeah, and I will try to keep it short. Um, actually, I'm not sure whether we need more and better global um, global norms and disruptive approaches on this level because I mean, what we need is better norms on every level and we also need better norms on the state level and on the local level and I mean there's a pretty cool book uh, it's called if mayors ruled the world and it highlights the power of mayors and we are talking about the federal level the global level and the state level today but not about the local level and the local level is very powerful as well and um taking my example my very first example from today back into consideration i mean it would not have taken us that long if there would not have been um, a federal regulation a federal norm so we could have been faster without regulation on a higher level so it, it always depends and i guess what we really need is more effective more really in the substance oriented um, and targeted um, um, norms and laws and acts and so on. So that is what we need. We need a better regulation for what we are doing and we need less regulation where we can ma make less regulation possible so that investments can flow so that decisions can be made on the lower level. And I guess it depends. It always depends. And um, the second part, I just wanted to say two things for um, to the CO2 price and the subsidies regarding the CO2 price. Actually, that would be something that would be pretty cool if the European Union and the United States would come to an agreement on finding a logic to find a price system. That would be pretty interesting because I guess that would really take down barriers for many companies, for many businesses um, in the transatlantic area. So that would be pretty cool. Maybe the new approaches of the new Biden um, administration will bring us um, forward in this um, sphere. And um, regarding the subsidies, I mean, it is not really a debate in Germany, to be honest. I mean, we all know that we have to cut back the negative subsidies and we will do that no matter what, we will do it. And I guess it's just a matter of time and it's the, the same with the norms. We need to be faster with that, but we know that we have to do it and we should do it fast, not just for the climate, but also for our economy and our businesses because they have to find their places in a new climate-friendly environment. And we need to prepare them for this climate-friendly environment. This is what it is about. And we have to play a strong role in supporting them. And I guess um, we will do that um, in the upcoming years and months. Thank you, Yoshka. Barbara, over to you. Just one idea concerning the, the question of Hubertus, if we are too, um, too slow in our decisions, and I think, no, we, we are not. I hope we are not. Um, and if I had to choose between regulations and innovation and enabling people to invent new things, I would, I would choose the second. Um, an example, um, palm wood. Yeah. Um, there are uh, thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of hectares in Indonesia 
where you grow uh, palm oil. And uh, the wood of oil palms is uh, low quality. You can't, can't do anything with it. Uh, it's it's uh, rubbish uh, because it's not stable, it's minor quality, it's uh, not of any use. And often it's burned or left behind and both is causing emissions of, do you say uh, uh, greenhouse gases? Do you use? Yeah, okay. And there's a project led by Bavarian engineers and paid with a bit of state money from Bavaria. And they found a way to use this wood uh, to create a building, a really high quality building material. And what's uh, the effect? They built um, uh, industrial um, things in, in Indonesia. They, uh, they built jobs. They avoid to burn uh, the, the palm wood. And we re-import uh, high quality uh, building material and we can avoid to, to cut our woods, what's well, so important for us. And that makes much more sense and much more effect to climate change than, than any regulations we could do from our place. So, so I really hope that we are um, good in innovation and be um, perhaps a bit uh, faster in administration. That's what I would like to have. Thank well, you. Barbara, Yoshka, Ryan, I want to thank the three of you and of course Mari as well for this very lively and, and I thought very engaging conversation. I learned a lot. Um, the four of you covered a lot of ground and yet there were a number of issues that I would have loved to press each of you on a little bit. Um, I'm happy that toward the end Stormy brought up Build Back Better because one issue that we didn't really get into as much as I would have liked to was the issue of infrastructure. And even though Barbara and Yoshka had a chance to talk about structural change through an environmentally conscious lens in their states, I really wanted to ask about the experiences in Pennsylvania and Michigan where that's been an important topic as well. Um, so there's obviously a lot more to talk about, but I want to bring our conversation full circle when I say it all comes down to people and partnerships and working together to try to address some of these challenges. And I want to thank all of you for engaging in this dialogue in this exchange of ideas, because um, certainly when I think about the work of ACG and the work of Aspen, Dialogue is what it comes down to, to having fora for this kind of exchange. And so with that, let me turn the floor over to Stormy for a, a final remark or two. And we are going to continue this dialogue. <laughs> Our next meeting is going to be on um, May 20th. And what we will focus on is um, structural change in our economies, um, skills, education, and how we can um, adapt our workforce and make them ready for all those big challenges which are ahead of us. Um, and I think this is also going to be um, a wonderful discussion. Um, as, as shown today, um, we have a trustful exchange, um, even if we have different differing um, opinions, um, what we um, and also ACG stand for um, is bringing everybody together um, and, and, and having a dialogue um, about this. And we want to continue this. And Steve, as you mentioned, infrastructure, probably this is a topic which we should revisit um, in one of our future um, exchanges and look a little bit deeper into um, the programs um, which have been now initiated or being tried to be initiated. <laughs> so I think there is lots to do. Um, and um, in German, I would, see, uh, I would say, um, Gleiche Welle, gleiche Stelle. Um, we hope to see you again in the future. Um, stay safe, um, stay healthy, and uh, come back to us. Thank you so much to our speakers and uh, join us again. Um, goodbye for tonight. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.